This is a Commodore PC-1, an IBM PC compatible computer by Commodore. A very small form factor and low cost computer. Released by Commodore in 1987, one of its main competitors was the Amstrad Snyder PC-1512. Target audience was both office users but also home users, as Commodore is quite the iconic brand in the home computer market. Now this is a very small, lightweight computer. It has a very plasticky feel to it, and we'll find out later why it is so small, as it is non-expandable whatsoever. Now I got this PC from an acquaintance who kindly offered it to me for a review, but with one big caveat, and that is that the computer is completely dead at the moment. It doesn't do anything, so we'll need to take a look at that. So let's go over some specs real quick. It features a Siemens 8088 Intel based CPU, it has 512 kilobytes of RAM, a 5 and a quarter inch 360 kilobyte floppy drive, it doesn't have a hard drive, doesn't have any expansion slots, it does have a standard XT style keyboard, it can, you can use a standard mouse or an Amiga mouse, it has both MDA, Hercules and CGA support, and there are serial parallel ports available as well as an fl external floppy drive controller. Now comparing it to the IBM PC, it is considerably smaller, but this type of form factor obviously comes at a price, as there is no expansion possible. Now if you look at the front of the device, we have the nice Commodore PC-1 logo, a power LED indicator, and a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Now my unit came with a Commodore 1402 monochrome display, hooked up to the MDA Hercules adapter. Manufactured in 1988 and offering a standard 9-pin D-sub connector, it fits the unit quite nicely. As far as keyboards are concerned, it comes with a full-sized 84-key QWERTY layout keyboard with the 10 function keys on the left. A pretty standard layout, not exactly the same as the Model F. It also has the 16 key numeric keypad. Now the keyboard uses a standard DIN connector so it can be used on any XT based system. The mouse that it came with however was an Amiga compatible mouse and this computer happily accepts these kinds of input devices. Now moving on to the left we have the keyboard connector, a standard mouse connector and an external disk drive connector. And moving to the back, we have the power switch, the power input and output, the 9-pin D-sub connector for the display. We also have an RCA jack for video output and the dip switches to configure the, the different video modes. We have an expansion slot, more on that later. And we have a parallel and serial port. So it's a nice little setup and a nice entry level into the IBM PC compatible market but it can't really shake off its Commodore Amiga desktop home computer type systems. So let's see if we can open her up. As there are no visible screws on top, let's take a look at the back where we have some information on the Commodore model. And there should be two screws here and here. So we're gonna be taking our screwdriver and unscrewing these screws so that we can have a look at the inside. Now this top lid should come off very easily and we can take a look inside. So here we have the power supply unit, the five and a quarter inch floppy drive and some shielding that hides the stuff that we really want to see which is the main board. So a very compact unit. There is still some room in the casing but unfortunately no expansion slots to add expansion cards or something like that. So we'll start by disconnecting the power connector so that we can get rid of the shielding. There's one screw that we need to unscrew that holds the shielding in place. And with that out of the way, we can remove the shielding so that we can take a look at well, the first half of the main board. Now, 
as the original owner told me, the system wouldn't start. So I think it's best that we take a peek inside the power supply unit to see what's going on over there. So there are a couple of screws that we need to remove to get the, the metal casing off so that we can have a look at the internals. Now I'm not a big fan of, of working on power supplies. I like to keep my voltages in DC and fairly low. So I'm not going to be doing any in-depth investigation on this just to see in, in what kind of condition it is. I'm going to be doing some measurements with my multimeter. So I'm first going to disconnect all of the peripherals from the power supply, which is just the floppy drive controller and the motherboard that we have already disconnected. I've taken my multimeter, set it to the voltage setting DC and hooked it up to this Molex connector so that I have easy access to the 5 volt rail. So I'm going to plug in the mains cable and see what the power supply does when I turn it on. Now I should get a voltage reading here. So let's see. And we see nothing. Nothing on the 5 volt rail. So that explains why the PC doesn't start. Now I'm also going to check the 12 volt rail, which is also exposed on this uh, Molex connector. So it's, it's a very convenient way to to probe around a circuit so you don't need to probe inside the PSU itself. And again, nothing. So nothing on the 12 volt rail, nothing on the 5 volt rail. Now the power supply itself seems to be in pretty good shape. There are no visual markings or burns that I can see, but this can be a transformer failure or an, uh, an IC failure, which is driving the transformer. But as I said, I'm not a power supply expert nor a fan. So I'll be leaving this for now and look for another solution. Now, in order to get complete access to the main board, we need to remove the floppy drive. So it's held in place using these four plastic clips. Now, I hate these kind of clips because they're so easy to break off. So we're going to be gently pushing them down on one side to see if we can safely remove the, the floppy drive. And with one side off, it's pretty easy to remove the rest of the floppy drive. So we'll be taking that out completely and have a look at it. And here it is, our five and a quarter inch, 360 kilobyte floppy drive. Looks really good from the outside. So let's hope it works flawlessly as well. I'm also going to be removing the power supply as obviously it isn't working and we'll need to have another solution in place for this. So this just slides right off. So the floppy connector is embedded on the board. I'm going to be removing the ribbon cable. I'm also going to be removing these small heat sinks on these chips. I don't think they're really needed, but that way we can have a look at the actual stuff which is underneath. And here we have a good view of the main board. So I am going to be taking out the main board out of the plastic casing. And for that, we need to wiggle these little plastic clips here in order to get the main board out of it, which is a very, very annoying task because you don't want to break off these things, but yet the motherboard fits in oh so tightly in those things that you need to apply some level of force to them in order to click the board out of it. So we're going to be doing that like four times until it's been completely removed. And then ultimately we should be able to just slide out the main board off of the plastic casing. So now we can take a closer look at the actual main board. We have our CPU here next to the empty socket for the floating processing unit. So the CPU is a Siemens 8088. We have 512 kilobytes of RAM, two times eight chips, including two for parity, plus four empty sockets to bring up the memory to 640K. We have the BIOS of the computer. And to the bottom right, we have some video chips. We have the character ROM. 
Now this computer doesn't have a bunch of Intel 8088 supporting chips as most XT clones have, but rather it uses this Faraday 2010 chip that implements most if not all of the functions that these individual chips support. This includes direct memory access controller, clock generation, peripheral interfacing or interrupt controller. Now this 2010 chip also works together with the MOS 5720 chip to control the PC's bus and peripherals, a chip that is also found in lots of Commodore Amiga systems. So here we have the parallel and serial port. And finally, the floppy drive controller, uh, both the internal one as well as the external one, where you can attach uh, Amiga disk drives and, and read the Amiga file formats. So yeah, pretty interesting little board we have here. Now I did find some markings here below this chip, which didn't come off with isopropyl in the beginning, but I was able to scrape it off a little bit. So this is probably not gonna be a big deal, using some isopropyl alcohol to clean everything up. And I checked the traces and everything seemed to be fine. Another thing I noticed was the complete absence of a PC speaker. Now, despite the fact that the documentation clearly specifies that there is a speaker header, and I can also find it on the board, there was no PC speaker to be found. Now, because this motherboard has a proprietary power connector, and I don't have such a connector, the only way that I could figure out on how to attach something was to use this old ATX power supply connector. It was the only thing that I found that could fit. So I took the pin out of the power connector on the Commodore PC-1 and basically all the voltages that are required are also made available on the ATX power connector. So I'm going to be reusing that. Now obviously the wiring is a bit different so I'll need to reroute the wires a little bit so that they correspond to the power connector on the Commodore PC-1. So I'm just going to cut off this connector here because this power supply is dead anyways and I have no plans of fixing it. But I will be using the connector part of it and the actual wires that are needed to power the, the main board. So I'm going to be speeding up this a little bit as it's not the most interesting or best job that I've ever done. Uh, so it involves a lot of organizing the wires, making sure we don't make any mistakes, cleaning up the other cables a little bit, stripping the cables so that we can hook them up to another ATX power supply, tinning the wires so that we can make a proper connection. Now this is a temporary setup so I'm not going to be hooking up any actual connectors here. I will be talking about alternatives, alternative power supplies later on. And as you can see, the adapter that I have created is now hooked up to an actual working ATX power supply with all of the voltage rails set up correctly. So with the power supply started, we're gonna be checking the voltages on our custom ATX connector. So I have it hooked up to ground right here. And I'm gonna be using my other probe to check on the six pins that I have available here. So we'll start on the left where we should have five volts which is what we have. The pin next to it should also be five volts. So, yep. The third pin is not connected, so this will be just floating. Next up we have the 12 volt, which also appears to be fine. We've got the negative 12 volts. 11.2, which is a bit off, but I think it should be sufficient. And then we have two ground pins. So these should just short the ground. So that seems perfectly fine now. So first power on test, nothing connected except for the motherboard. And let's give it some power. Oh, and we see it booting up. So this is nice. This is nice. So this means that there are no catastrophic failures within the computer itself. So the power supply was dead, but using an alternate power supply, we got the system up and running. So let's hook up some peripherals and see if it will actually boot. 
So I've hooked up my five and a quarter inch floppy. I'm going to insert a MS-DOS 3.2 bootable disk and let's start her up. It has picked up the disk. There's an error in my config.sys somewhere, but that's okay. It's loading up my iomega zip device driver and it has booted. So this is looking good. Now with the computer up and running again, albeit with an external ATX power supply, we can continue testing. In a follow-up video, I'll be installing this embedded power supply into the system. This should be able to provide the machine with ample power to run very stable. Although there are schematics available of the original power supply, I'm not going to be bothering with fixing it as it's over 30 years old and some of the components will be very hard to find. But for now the machine is running, so I hope you like this video and tune in for the follow-up video that I'll be doing. And if you like this one, please give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.